Good morning, afternoon, or evening. This is Bryn with Train by Text. This is going to be our third video in our PicoScope series for beginning users. And in this video, we're going to go over the individual channel settings and features, as well as some basic trigger functions. Again, this is going to be kind of introduction, uh, more of the advanced stuff we've done to some degree and we will continue to do so, but we wanted to get something put together for you guys that are just uh, starting out uh, using this product. So, appreciate you uh, coming along and let's uh, get started. This section here is the channel settings. Being a four channel scope, you have, of course, four channels, but Pico labels them A, B, C, and D. We'll start with B since it's just kind of more in the center of the screen as opposed to A. They're, both windows are going to have the same options. So the main, for, the first one here is the probe. And that's whatever test probe that you're using to take the capture. Times one is going to be your most common one. You're going to be displaying the signal just as it's being measured. But you have lots of other built-in probes. We'll talk about these times 10 or times 20, times 100 in just a moment. We'll uh, go over the rest and come back to them. But you have different clamps that you could use for measuring current. So uh, if you have these clamps and you choose them, whatever the calculation is, it does that for you and it will display it, your measurement in amperage. You could also do times 1 and just do the calculations yourself if you'd like. You know, Because most of them are pretty simple math like 100 milliamps or 100 millivolts equals an amp so that you could use the times one and it would represent it would display as voltage and you would just know you know that each 100 millivolts equals an amp and that's just one example scrolling back to down you have um, the WPS 500 is a three pressure transducers and one very good quality pressure transducer um, and so you would similar to this uh, current clamp you would it produces a voltage uh, based off the pressure course using pressure transducers that's the way it work works but by choosing these probes it will automatically calculate the pressure and display it as the pressure as opposed to the voltage output uh, but again um, you could use the times one and do the measurement uh, calculations yourself as well typically with current clamps and uh, pressure transducers at least early on most will do you choose the actual presets uh, probes in here. There is some benefits to doing the math yourself. Moving back down here, uh, you know, just more current clamps. Uh, we'll talk about the attenuators in just a moment. Of course you have your coil unplug, secondary ignition, paddle probes, uh, several on the market, and you have your uh, conventional secondary ignition lead um, probes as well. But going to the attenuators, the attenuators basically divide the actual circuit being measured before it enters the scope module. So uh, these attenuators would be, in the case of the Pico scope, they're B and C, just like your test leads are. And you would uh, put these in series with your test lead. You wouldn't put your test lead directly on the scope. You'd put your attenuator on the scope, and then you'd put your test lead on the attenuator. So the attenuator would end up being in series there, dividing the actual voltage before it enters the scope. You're probably wondering why that's necessary. Some of you that aren't familiar with the PicoScope, Snap-on users are not familiar with this, most likely because you don't need an attenuator for the Snap-on products. But with PicoScopes, it depends on what circuit you're measuring, and it depends on what scope you're actually using. Some of the older generation PicoScope automotive hardware, the 3000 series 2 and 4 channel scopes, have a 50 volt maximum input, and those came with a 20 to 1 attenuator. So. As you can imagine, there are some circuits on an automotive vehicle that produces more than 50 volts. So in order to reduce the likelihood of damaging the scope, you would use an attenuator so that you wouldn't have excessive voltage going into the scope. The 3000 series uh, 50 volt maximum input, the next generation was the 4423. Uh, we'll talk about the four channel part numbers anyways. That's the four channel oscilloscope 4000 series and uh, that went to a 100 volt maximum input. They still use the 20 to 1 attenuator on that. The latest uh, offering is the 4425 which uses a 200 volt maximum and they come with the 10 to 1 attenuators. So the example would be, let's say you're measuring a circuit, a primary ignition, for example, 
the inductive kick, you know, may be so quick that it's not necessarily going to mess up maybe the latest offering the 4425 with 200 volt maximum input, but the inductive kick on the primary does exceed 200 volts often. So to play it safe, you would use a 10 to 1 attenuator, which reduces the uh, actual voltage or divides it by 10 times. So if you, let's say you have 400 volt inductive kick, you would be reducing it down to 40 volts inductive kick. But by choosing either the 10 to 1 attenuator or up here, the times 10, then you're telling the software to multiply the actual measurement entering the scope back 10 times so that this it display it back at the 400 volt. Hopefully that makes sense. A lot of veteran Pico users won't use the 10 to 1 or the 20 to 1 attenuators. They'll use the times 10 and times 20. And you're probably wondering why that is. Well, we'll show you. If you choose the 10 to 1 attenuator, and we'll talk about this next section in just a moment, but this is your settings that you can choose for how it's going to display the voltage uh, measurement. You only have one choice if you choose the 10 to 1. But if you choose times 10, now you choose this and you have a lot more choices with regard to uh, what you want your measurement settings to be. So that's the main reason we'll use the times 10 or times 20 as opposed to the 10 to the 1 or 20 to 1 attenuators. So going back to this measurement, I think we pretty much already displayed it, but we'll touch on a couple things here. Most of the Pico scope settings are going to be, as you can see, plus or minus. So what that means is, by default, the center of the screen uh, is zero, just like the red one does. They both start at zero. And as you can see, we have tw plus or minus 20 here on the channel A, which is the blue on the left-hand side. Anything above zero goes from zero to 20 volts, and anything below goes from zero to negative 20 volts. So that's what they mean by plus or minus 20 volts. And uh, going back to this area, you see some other options. The low pass filtering, so the filtering is actually built into the software, so you don't have to have a physical uh, low pass filtering hardware that you would use with your scope if you wanted to filter uh, a signal. What we recommend is acquiring and saving your capture without the filter, and then for those signals that rec may require some filtering to, to clean them up, make it easier on the eye to see what's going on, then you would click the filtering and then what's cool is you can uh, you can increase and decrease the filtering level on it. And then you can just turn it simply turn it right back off. The next section here is vertical scaling and offset. And for that we'll go back over to the red just so you can see what's happening over here. You'll notice the red is plus or minus 20 volts. If I increase the vertical scaling then you're going to basically vertically zoom that capture. So you can see now even though we have plus or minus 20 volts, it's showing up as plus or minus 10 volts because we've zoomed in zoomed in twice on the capture. So each time you zoom in, it's going to provide a larger vertical zoom. You can see and the other thing is offset which will help us to if we move this offset we'll be able to see that our zoom is better. So if we offset it, we're just raising and lowering the uh, offset on the of the capture on the actual screen. As we increase the offset, the capture, the trace goes higher. As we dec decrease it, the capture goes lower. And zero being right back in the center of the screen, like we mentioned just before. But we'll increase the offset, get this thing up. We can also do it by dragging, you know, holding the left mouse button on this area and dragging up and down. Going back here, now that we have it. It's not being covered up by the blue trace, we can show you the vertical scaling a little better. Each time you do some vertical scaling, it just allows you to get that trace a little bigger if you need to for analyzing. Some of the main reasons you would do this is relative compression testing. Another one would be um, using pressure transducers in the exhaust or the intake manifold. Oftentimes you would use vertical scaling. There are other reasons as well, but uh, those are for later videos. So that's that. <coughs> And we've covered this area as well. When depending on what you choose, if you're choosing a current clamp, then your options are going to be. Uh, we'll use choose this 30 amp clamp, and your options are going to be obviously amperage because again, um, it's going to do the math for you and 
uh, display your measurement in the actual current. If you're choosing a pressure transducer, then your choices are going to be in pressure. Uh, if you choose your coil unplugs and your secondary ignition leads, then you're going to have kilovolt scale represented there. So next here, uh, by the way, you can click this area, arrow down and it gives you all your choices or if you just want to do some quick adjustments you can adjust left and right. And then the next feature here is just the AC or DC sampling feature. Most of the time you're going to live here at the DC sampling. There's a few tests that you would want to use the AC uh, coupling. Uh, an obvious one would be charging system uh, diode tests. You, you would use a AC coupling for that. So others as well, but again, just uh, some of these specific tests we're going to get more into for some of our later videos. Last but not least, we're going to touch briefly on a couple of things. Um, we mentioned that you can drag and drop here is another way you can do the offset. But as well, if you see at the bottom of the capture, these, this red box is the settings, scale and offset setting uh, for that channel B as well. So you can see we can move the scale and the offset there as well. And then at the bottom here, this stops the capture, a green arrow starts it again. Uh, or you can just simply hit the red stop to stop it and hit it again to start it. Another thing I forgot to mention that I want to make sure I do mention is anytime that you make any adjustments up here, see it's at, for example, uh, notice that we're at 15 of 15 pages, so it keeps uh, counting, it keeps saving the last 15 pages. This, But notice we're at 15 of 15. If I move sample down, you can see I, I, the buffer starts back, which means that you've lost those pages. So keep that in mind. Anytime you make any changes up here, you're going to lose whatever's in the buffer. So a, a valuable tip is to, if you have pages in the buffer that you need to analyze, um, let's say it's got an intermittent issue and finally you were able to get it, get the glitch, you know, and the trace found and you have those pages, stop it and save it before you do anything else. Just to keep you from losing those valuable uh, buffered pages. Trigger down here at the bottom here left you have four options no trigger auto repeat and single I'll talk about that in just a moment this next area is the advanced trigger functions but the main one for now we're going to talk about is just whether you're triggering off the rising edge or the falling edge if you see here this um, green little square represents where the trigger would be you can see it's going to be capturing the rising edge of the waveform if you choose falling edge you'll see that the trigger is now going to be capturing the trace at the falling edge. And again, uh, different benefits for different uh, reasons. So we're at the rising edge. The next one here is going to be your being able to choose what channel you want to trigger off of. In this case, we're going to trigger off of A. Uh, this area here is if you want to just quickly choose rising edge or falling edge, you can do so here. This is rising edge and this is falling edge. And then here are your trigger settings, like where it displays vertically and then this one is where you would have it displayed horizontally or you could just simply dra grab the trigger and move it anywhere on the screen so that's just kind of covering some of the basic uh, trigger functions as you can see the trigger allows you to stabilize the waveform if you go back down here and you choose none then you can see the waveform is moving around um, if you choose single It'll capture it the one time and it'll stop it. And there's certainly benefits to that as well. But again, a lot of these more advanced trigger functions we'll go over in more detail in another video. So that's it for today. We appreciate you guys watching. Keep an eye out for the next ones coming up. Don't forget to like the video. Uh, make comments. The comments definitely help uh, everybody. And please subscribe to our channel. Uh, thank you again for your time and attention. And uh, we hope you enjoy. Take care.